welcome to the stage, Emmy Raver Lampman and Robert Sheehan. <laughs> I, I am not even going to ask about that just yet. I'm, I'm just going to let you, me around. We'll circle back. We'll circle uh, back. We'll circle back on that. Um, <laughs> you guys, welcome to Chicago. Thank oh, you so thank much you for having us. Oh man, I love the shy. I love the city so much. I mean, if this is any indication to you what a great, great show Umbrella Academy is, I don't know what it is. Do you guys love the show? <laughs> yes! <laughs> It is, it is honestly just an incredible season of TV. And first of all, I'm just curious, were either of you guys familiar with the source material when you were initially up for the roles or when you were cast? Uh, no, I wasn't. I got a call from my agent who's side stage. She'll thank me for saying this. <laughs> but she goes, uh, yeah, you know, Rob, it's this comic book. It was written by the Chemical Brothers. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? So yeah, that was about how familiar we were with the source material before, <laughs> yeah. before being given Same. the script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, I read the script for the first episode, um, and then there was, and, and then I sent in my audition, and then there was kind of like a couple months that went by, and then when I found out that I had a callback, then I was like, I should probably read these graphic novels, probably. <laughs> right? I mean, figure out a little bit more about this crazy family. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about Allison is, even though obviously it's a it's a superhero show and all this stuff, you're you're reluctant to use your powers for most of season one, and so it's almost like you're in a family drama. Like, oh yes, you know. Yes. Well, I, I also will say that that is what drew me to the show initially. Uh -huh. Is that it is more about these. This, these individuals and this family on a very human level and um, just how they agree and disagree and agree to disagree um, and fight and how they kind of all exist in this house with the past they have and also with the powers that they have and how they kind of go through life using them and not using them and um, I was definitely drawn to the drama side of it more than I was drawn to the superhero side of it for sure. Right well it get, it's a catalyst for which like a very human story can be told in a way. Um, you guys had to create that dynamic of siblings that grew up together but then hadn't seen each other in a long time and then reconverge. How did, how did you as actors sort of facilitate that relationship? It was pretty quick. Yeah, you know, we, we, there was one night of wild karaoke, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got the director yeah. of the first episode very drunk <laughs> in a karaoke and, place yeah, in Toronto. That was really it. It was like we all showed up in Toronto. We had like a meet and greet. We read the first episode, and then we were all like, "Let's go to the bar." And then we ended up at a karaoke joint till five in the morning, and. Uh, we're like, I think this is going to work. Yeah. <laughs> bond the way All of us except for poor Aiden, because, you know. Yeah, the way dysfunctional families bond, which is get drunk together, essentially. Well, it's for quick bonding. Apparently it works. <laughs> so, the, okay, Klaus, I, I love his character. I love your character so much. So amazing. This you, is so, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was say, this is so surreal. I was at home three days ago on the tube in London, and now I'm in Chicago, sat in front of 3,000 people all cheering. It's very kind of... It's, it's, well, it's a hard thing to kind of to, to get your head around, you know? Well, that's the phenomena of Netflix shows. Like, this is they drop all at once. So I remember Millie Bobby Brown talking about, like, Stranger Things had not premiered, and then, like, a week later. Have you guys had similar experiences where you just have, like, exploded on social media and people recognizing you? Oh, yeah. It, it's it's oh. very it's still it's still strange the fact that we have pop dolls is like that's never a thing that I ever thought would happen in my entire life and now I'm signing these little dolls that look like me it's so weird but it's so ama it's amazing it's right. just like that was never on like my list of musts for my life <laughs> was having a pop doll and you know it happened so fast but it's been amazing over the course of a year it's been a sort of a controlled explosion. Yeah. Yeah. Life, life has changed, I'd say. Yeah. Over the course of a year, definitely. In terms of, I think, how famous I am. <laughs> how I'm seen as an actor. Do you know what I mean? 
people cut, like in Ireland, it's funny, you know, like Ireland, if you're successful in Ireland, that's one thing, but if you're sort of perceived success internationally, you become a bit like the mayor in Ireland. <laughs> like here, hold that baby and have a picture with my nan. <laughs> like, who are you? Yeah. So, um, yeah, life, you know, the surf is lovely. There's a deep sort of respect in the subtext of it and a kind of a, dare I say it, a, a, a reverence, albeit temporary. Well, Klaus has spent, you know, a lot of, a lot of his life repressing his powers and his ability um, until he, of course, goes back in the past and falls in love. And then I'm wondering how you brought the two sides of the character together, the present day and the past Klaus. I think the editor did that. Well, the editor did a good job, but it was your you know, performance. You, you, yeah, you know, you just kind of have to take it moment by moment. Yeah. And the, the show is spectacularly edited. I saw a few bits uh, of the second series because I went in and did some dialogue recording in a booth where you kind of look at yourself and then you try and mime to yourself. It's, it's a very natural process, right? <laughs> and... Um, but, uh, what was my point? Oh yeah, the, it, I've, at the editing of this, the bit, I just I was struck again by the spectacular editing of the show. It's really tight, and you know, it, it not only like it follows the plot so beautifully and tightly, but the emotional plot, you know, and that w that's very tricky, especially when you're dealing with very abstract things like sci-fi, and so. The editor did it, essentially. You know, well, boom. like I said, he did a great job, but it's your performance, so uh -huh. it's yeah. it's a combined effort. Yeah. We're gonna open it up to questions. I know you guys are just as anxious as I am to talk to them, and while they sort of get themselves organized, Emmy, you have yes. been a part of another little project, Hamilton. Oh, just um, a small, <laughs> small. <laughs> little thing. Um, can you, if, if, huge fan oh, of that as well, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about your experience working? In yeah, um, well, you know, no one's ever really heard of that show, so it's very small. Um, no, I mean, it was an amazing experience. I was a part of the original Broadway cast, um, and then I actually um, brought the show, I opened the company here in Chicago, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if anybody saw it when it was here for like the first three months in 2016, I was in the show then. Um, but, which is, you know, I lived in Chicago for six months, almost to a year, and I, that's why I love this city. But um, it, Hamilton is, I mean, what is there not to say? You guys know, just from the soundtrack, even if you haven't seen it, it's something that's really special, and it's lightning in a bottle, and it's so universal, and everyone can kind of connect I've, to this. I've got a bit of a good Hamilton story. My friend yes. got tickets to Hamilton, um, her boyfriend got them tickets. I think it was over the holidays, and they were sat. They were so excited to see the show in New York, and they went along. And there was someone right behind them, in the seats right behind them, and they were singing along to the songs, and they were kind of going. <sighs> and then her boyfriend was like, "I'm going to say something. I'm going I'm to say something." She's like, no, "No, no, no!" And they kept going on and on and on. And he was like, "All right, finally, excuse me, will you?" And it was Paul McCartney. <laughs> And his son, I think, but one of his children. And they were like singing along and they were like, oh, 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 oh. never mind. You're like, actually, no, keep singing, yeah, please. Yeah. Paul, be quiet. Right? I think that's what you have to do in that situation. Oh, yeah, yeah you absolutely. start recording. <laughs> Hi, we'll start over here. Hi, how are you? Uh, Chadwell from Chicago. Hello. Hello. Um, originally, I wanted to put this question to all the members of the cast. But the question is, how much research did you do? And therefore, yes, like, how much research did you do for drug addiction? How much research did you do for mediums? But for you, you're a charismatic celebrity playing a charismatic celebrity, so... Um, <laughs> and going, oh, it's difficult to tell people what you want them to do? If you told me to shut up, I'll go back to my seat. <laughs> I heard a rumor that you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I think for me, the, the, the thing that I kind of had to wrap my brain around the most was I, I, I'm, I grew up an only child. I have a half-sister, but she is 20 years younger than me. 
So, you know, being a sibling, that's like something that I, I don't know what that is. And especially being a part of such a big family and that family dynamic, that was kind of something that intimidated me from the beginning, especially like you asked, having to immediately have a relationship with, you know, six complete strangers that I've never met before. Um, so that was, that was kind of the thing that, you know, I don't really know how you research Google, how to be a sibling. <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, that was kind of, I have really close friends, and so I kind of investigated the really close friendships that I have in my life, because, you know, some of my really close girlfriends are my sisters. Um, and so I kind of tried to bring as much of that, um, you know, into, into Allison as much as possible. But also, you know, Allison is a mom, and that, that was another thing that I kind of had to wrap my brain around a little bit. And, but also, because my sister is so much younger than me, I also kind of investigated that relationship. So everything that I needed to figure out who Allison was, I did have in some form or another as, like, as Emmy, as myself. And so I kind of, you know, as actors, we try to pull as much from our own lives and the experiences we have in real life and kind of manipulate them into this new being that we're trying to create. And so for me, the friendships that I have and having a really young, a much younger sister, um, that kind of, and the maternal instincts that I have towards her, just as, because she's my younger sibling, that kind of helped me figure out the relationship between Allison and Claire. And then, you know, Allison and this fool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what about Klaus? Did you do a lot of research or? Yeah, you know. Um, Karaoke night, that was research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, saw, I did a few things. I, um, I did a lot of kind of automatic writing in the character, which I'd never really done before, which was interesting. A lot of it kept going back to childhood and going back to childhood. Um, what else did I do? Let me think, let me think. Uh, I don't know, I went out and took loads of Class A drugs. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, I, did this, I did this other thing actually as well, which was like, a, I, I tried to do like an, an artistic diary of Klaus, but I'm not very good at drawing, so I just ended up Googling like pictures of taps or pictures of things that I was trying to draw, you know, it was like, but I, I sort of, I just, you know, actors are sort of solitary creatures sometimes and you, you kind of go in a darkened room and pace back and forth and try and wear the skin of the character as much as possible. Like I'd go into shops as Klaus, you know, for a while. And, Would you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in London and yeah. just, just just be him on the street and to strangers and stuff, I, you know. And so, how'd it go? <laughs> yeah, fine. I mean, you know, I did this in London, where I mean, you could be, yeah, you could have three heads and people would barely look at you, you know, because they're so city. Uh, so I think it was just time and, and uh, writing down as many of the th unpacking thoughts as Klaus, you know? You kind of have to, you, you have to build a past, a present, and a future, and all of that informs the performance, you know? And it really does, it really, really does. And I think things happened unconsciously in the performance as a result of discoveries that I'd made of the character. So research is kind of often, the, it's the same journey, it's like you have to, figure out who this person is. And I heard Daniel Day-Lewis say a nice thing. He said, it's not a character, it's a human being. It's a 360 human being. And you have to treat them like that and give them everything that a person has, you know? A life, you know? And so the more you give them, the more of that nuance shows up on screen. So I just sort of did as much of that as possible, really. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Hi. Oh my God. Hello. That statue is talking. <laughs> uh, my name is Fabs. I'm from Chicago. Um, thank you for being fabulous as Klaus. Thank you. Um, my question is, since you're enjoying being mayor, when was the first time you realized um, this is actually like a very big thing? 
when they realized the show was actually really garnering a huge fan base and, yeah. oh. and becoming I'm very popular. I'm still in shock. I yeah, don't think yeah. I'm still, the fact that you guys are all sitting here have and have any interest in what I'm saying is insane. <laughs> it really is, it's really humbling and I, it's still, you know, because I think that's the thing with Netflix is that, you know, 10 episodes drop in three seconds yeah, and it's yeah. global, it's not just America. It's not just this country for a couple months and then Netflix gets the rights and then it goes to a couple other countries. With our show, it was within one minute, it was all over the world. Mm. And that is still a thing that I, I can't even wrap my brain around. You know, yeah. you know, when we were doing press, we went to Brazil. And I was like, people in Brazil watch our show? That's so insane. But it's like, they, yeah, it's amazing. It's the reach is something that I, I never, I didn't, even really think about mm. when we were shooting it and making it, and I think it's still something that I can't, I can't even wrap my brain around. It's still very surreal. So, there, you know, there was a, about a week and a half after the release of the show, I got a text from Steve Blackman, who's the showrunner, saying, "You're on a hit show, sir." And then, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And then there was a f sort of few statistics and bits about the viewing figures and all that. And it was, it was kind of that message yeah. that kind of went, you know, and I think, St uh, you know, Steve is, he's from, he's, I, I don't know if he's from LA, is he from LA? Toronto. Oh yeah, yeah he's, he's from Toronto. Toronto, of course, of course. But he's, you know, he's all, he lives in Hollywood and he's of that world, so to kind of come from him, it felt like, it just, felt very significant yeah because you know? he's worked like we, to, you know he was worked on Grey's Anatomy and has done like huge shows huge so for shows. him to be like you got this show is people are watching this show it's yeah. like well if you're saying that that's crazy yeah yeah, yeah. 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 so that was really it and then yeah thank you thank, thank you yeah. so much thanks Babs hi hi I'm Cher from Portland Oregon and my questions for Robert uh, Robert, in your short 32 years, you've shown so much uh, diversity in your roles and the films that you've selected that it's made so many of us in this room super fans. Thank you. Um, you've brought your own unique flair to big budget films, low budget films, romance, historical drama, black and white films, short films, foreign language films, family films, art, yes. book adaptations, science fiction, foreign language, yeah, pictures. sure. <laughs> You did, you did an Irish language film, on which I watched, a short film. Um, animated feature, comedy, horror, action, music, biography, teen films, supernatural films, holiday specials, courtroom you, drama, Nordic drama, British... Nordic TV drama? Series. Nordic drama, yes. yes. True. He did, and he was brilliant. Uh, British TV series, Irish TV series, Netflix series. Is this your Wikipedia page? She's you, reading your Wikipedia page. You, you are a super fan. <laughs> Good on you for putting this together. This is you amazing. are a super fan. Do you have a question? Do, do you want to uh, be my publicist? <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes. Even Shakespeare on stage. Uh, you flawlessly nailed at least 10 accents and you've stolen every scene. So my question for you is one thing that you haven't done is a Netflix spin-off. Are you open to Klaus? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Absolutely. For those of you, Jared Way, who created Umbrella Academy, he's done a prequel about, absolutely, about uh, Klaus in the sort of five or six years before the beginning of the Umbrella Academy story, where he's just sort of pottering around and get, essentially... It's you walking around London. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> that I was researching that as, as much as the other thing. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's the kind of Klaus story before um, the reunion of the family, essentially, because before uh, the, the start of Umbrella Academy, they're all very, very estranged. They all haven't seen each other in, I believe, about 16 years. So he... And, you know, he talked about it in the, in the context of when he was, you know, in full rock star mode, you know, he had problems with, with drugs and alcohol, and he had a very, very reckless, hedonistic time, as far as I know. And, you know, if he'd gone on any longer, it would have killed him. So he stopped, but 
out, he said, out of that time, there's, there's a great creative well to draw from, is how he put it. So I think that's where the, um, the kind of inspiration for the, the few years of, of Klaus, just kind of, and some of the stuff he's told me about that's going to be in it is just so <laughs> incredibly dark and fucked up. So, uh, yeah, I'm well up for that. Absolutely up for that, yeah. Thank you, and thank you for that, that dossier. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. That wiki dossier. page. Can I get a copy of that? <laughs> it's your new resume. <laughs> Hi. If you didn't know about Nordic films, <laughs> he's got a resume. All right, uh, my name is Kevin from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, hello, Ken. Hello. Um, I have to address the shoes. I absolutely... I, I absolutely love them, and I want to know where you got them, and do you have them in any other colors? <laughs> They're Doc Martens, and I, I was back in my parents' house in Ireland over the holidays, and because, bless my parents and their eternal patience, whenever I move, like if I go away, you know, for six months to do a job, like Umbrella Academy, I often just move out of an apartment, you know, I've been very sort of nomadic in my life in that way, so my parents... At, an, at that juncture, we'll just end up getting 10 more boxes on a van that go up in the attic. And I was there over the holidays, and I was going through some of the stuff. Memory lane, memory lane, going down memory lane. And I found these pink shoes. And I was like, what are you doing in storage? <laughs> They've just been sat in a box for like two, three years. So I've, I've let them spread their wings once again. And they've, they've been a great hit today. They've, been, they've got so many compliments for them. They're like, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Doc Martin. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Ashley, and I'm from Hobart, Indiana, northwest Indiana. Not too far away. Um, so first of all, I want to say, Robert, you're great as Klaus. I love the betrayal. My Thank question, you very much. You're welcome. My question's for Emmy. Um, the scene with you and Luther dancing is like one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. <laughs> and I was actually wondering if you did any kind of dance training together and how long it took to actually film that. Oh, yes, we did. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Tom Hopper. <laughs> Bless Tom Hopper. He's never had to dance like that before. And he thinks he has two left feet, but he's actually pretty great. He's actually a really, really good dance partner. And we had um, Emma Portner, who is Ellen Page's wife. Um, she actually choreographed that dance um, specifically for us. And so we had maybe like a week of, re of rehearsals. Um, Cause it happened pretty quickly. Cause Steve, yeah, Steve was like, I have this idea. You and Tom are gonna do a dance in the park. And we were like, okay. And he was like, can you shoot it next week? <laughs> we were like, have you told Tom this? <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, it happened really quick, but Tom was like fully on board and he really wanted to learn. But I think, you know, he's really good at stunts and he likes to do his own stunts. And because of Black, um, black Sails? Is that right? Black Sails? Yeah. So he's, you know, he's, it is dancing and, and stunts are, it's choreography. So I think learning to dance is very similar to learning like a stunt fight. Um, and, you know, so he, we had a really good time and he ended up being so good. And I was so, I've never been more proud. I was like, <laughs> was like it was an awesome scene. Yeah, I was talking about it today because it looks so beautiful and so elegant and the lights come in. But it was like 4.30 in the morning. It was 19 degrees outside. We were in this park and they had to defrost all the snow. And there were, we were in this park essentially in, you know, where all these homeless people sleep at night. Like we were in their living room. And so they were so angry that we were kind of kicking them out of their temporary homes that they kept trying to make cameos in the shot. And, <laughs> and so our crew and all the cops that they had hired to kind of quarantine the area so that we could get this scene done were like chasing all these homeless people around the park in between all the, each shot. It was actually a really, I actually really enjoyed it. I kind of, if you look close enough and zoom in, you can probably see some scragglers in the back running around. Well, I loved it this. too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. My name's Kira and I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hello, Kira. Hi. Um, so obviously, 
I love and adore both of you. You're both amazing. Um, so in the show, there's a lot of very deep, very strong, like, emotional things with each and every character. Like, between Ka Klaus and his addictions to cope with his mental issues and what he's dealing with and, like, everything else. So who do you personally, like, relate to the most and who touches you the most? <laughs> Outside of their own characters? Kind of whoever, whomever they uh, relate to, like personally with their issues, like who's the most touching to you? In in the sh in the show, yeah. I think there's a little bit of all of them that I that I understand. You know, I think like Luther has this. Luther has daddy issues you know what I mean and and <laughs> he does and he just he just wants I mean they all do that's like the the big the umbrella under the umbrella is that they are all so messed up because their father gave them numbers not names do you know what I mean and built a robot to take care of them and you know taught a monkey like uh, paid more attention to this monkey that he taught how to speak and essentially turned a monkey into their butler and there was more affection towards Pogo from Hargreaves than there was for his children. And, you know, and he collected these kids. And so, you know, that in some way or another is gonna manifest differently and very individually for all of them. Um, so I think, you know, what I take from all of them, I think is that there are significant moments in everyone's life that, that affect you. And, and how you how you overcome those scenarios and whether it's being bullied or whether it's you know what I mean or if it's if it's addiction or if it's it's you know relationships in your life and I think um, you know this our show is really about how these characters manage the the relationships that have failed them in their lives and you know sometimes they do okay most of the time they don't <laughs> but I think at the end of the day you know they the strongest theme is that they constantly forget that they're all kind of going through the same thing and that if they actually come together and try to work on that together it actually will help them all heal because I think they're all separately thinking that they're struggling by themselves and they're not it's a great answer. <laughs> and, and yeah, he wasn't the best father. I think. <laughs> What'd you say? I said he was not the best father. He didn't really so. nail that. Didn't really nail it. <laughs> snappy dresser, though. <laughs> yeah, he looked great, though. His suits were fierce. <laughs> right, snappy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. I see Dolores there in the crowd, <laughs> which is the mannequin from Umbrella Academy. It's, it's been done really well. I hear, hear uh, number five and Dolores come. Are you going to... Oh, you guys. It will go over here. Yeah, you're next. Don't worry. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm from here in Chicago. Uh, so as you guys know, uh, 43 children were born on the same day as your characters, and Professor Hargreaves only got seven of them. Uh, is season two going to investigate the other 36 and possibly even meet them? Wouldn't that be fun? That would be fun. <laughs> Are, are you trying to get a spoiler here? <laughs> Wouldn't you, that be such a treat? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can speak for them because I've been warned by Netflix myself <laughs> that we can't talk about season two, but I'm with you that that would be very cool. That's all I can say. Yeah, I mean, we're bound it. to get around to it at some stage. You know what I mean? There's too, there's too, many, of, uh, too many of the others. Out there. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Hi, you look amazing. Uh, you look so awesome. You're making Aiden very proud. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Van. Oh, hello. Hi, sweets. Would you mind coming slightly closer to the mic, dear? Thank you. There we go. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. How are ya? Good. And I have a question. Um, in one of the episodes, um, Ben slaps um, Klaus, and he's a ghost. Do you think he's alive? It's <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Oh. Yeah, he Patrick Swayze's me. He doesn't really he? does. <laughs> <laughs> he really gets ya. Yeah. Well. He's, I think the, the, 
the kind of the evolution of Klaus as a result of him becoming sober sort of starts to see a development of not just Klaus but but Ben and Ben's direct influence on the world even though he is a ghost he is he is still technically dead <laughs> even though he's sort of dead with privileges <laughs> and uh, He's dead adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think it was, it was a way of uh, showing a, a kind of a strange benefit to Klaus's sobriety, you know? That Klaus is like absolutely just bored to death with being sober and he can't wait to escape into oblivion through terrible, awful, poisonous drugs. Um, but then this thing happens, and it's like, oh, what, what is this? What, you know, and it comes directly from the the start of the beat, the start of the sober journey, you know. So, and that, you know, without spoiling anything, that certainly is explored more in the second season. Yeah. So you know, there's a little tidbit for you. Thank you. And was this cosplay your own idea? You put this together? Yeah. Uh, yeah, me and my mom. You look awesome. You did a yeah, great look, job. Well done, awesome. mom. <laughs> and yourself. Good job, buddy. Thank oh, you. We have a you. <gasps> Hi. Oh, yes. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Chippy, and I'm from Vermont. Um, I was wondering um, if either of you have any kind of ritual or routine that you go through or even like a song that you listen to to help you get into your Umbrella Academy characters. Oh, well. Yeah, you've got like a whole thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but one thing that I've started to do over the last couple of years, which, you know, when you're on set, it's your main job as an actor to essentially delete out like 95% of the stuff that's around you, you know, and the kind of thing, and people are kind of, you know, doing the makeup, and you know, it's all very sort of fast paced until it isn't and slow. So there's lots of distraction. And so meditation basically has been the thing that has uh, vastly improved my ability to just be in the moment and to be able to delete all that stuff and that works universally Klaus or otherwise you know and it just feels really nice you know you just get all marshmallowy and calm and sweet and and then you can you can go and do your thing with a completely clear head you know so yeah meditation I would highly recommend it for you all in fact oh my god they did this experiment fifth, like over 50 times, which has become known as the peace field effect in different cities around the US with populations of millions where they got crowds about this size, slightly bigger, maybe 5,000 people to meditate together every single morning. And the crime rate of the entire city fell, ra like drastically fell. So, you know, we're all one consciousness, you know, death doesn't exist anyway. <laughs> What about you, Emmy? Does Allison have a theme song or? Um, I actually, for me, you know, first thing you do, or at least first thing I do when I get to work is, you know, I put my stuff down in my trailer and then I immediately have to go into hair and makeup. Um, and for me, because, you know, I wear wigs in the show and someone else is doing my makeup. For me, the you know hour or so that I'm in the hair and makeup trailer mm -hmm. is kind of when I say goodbye to Emmy for the day and say hello to Allison. Um, and I think that, because you know, when we were figuring out our looks for the first season, and you know, the rumor in, in the, the books, you know, has purple hair and she's, you know, got this edgy look. And so for a really long time, we were gonna use my natural hair. Um, and then, you know, there was conversations about wigs and, and I kind of went to Steve at some point and was like, I actually think it would be really helpful for me if I have a wig because I'm, I'm having a hard time right now separating myself from Allison if I go to work every day looking like myself. Um, and so for me, that transformation kind of sometimes happens and I don't even know it. Um, but, you know, having somebody else kind of do my makeup and I, I, you know, sit in front of the mirror and I watch it happen 
and then I go get my wig on and I kind of watch my hair get put up in a, a wig cap and then this other hair get put on top of my head. And then I go back to my trailer and I put on clothes that I don't wear and mm -hmm. you know things that aren't really my style. And for me, that, that kind of happens and then I can kind of go about the rest of the day kind of you know feeling like her because everything that is touching my body is has nothing to do with me right so that for me that really helps that's a really cool process and thank you great question thank you thanks chippy yeah hi hello hello, hello. sorry that's really hi um my name's claire i'm from st michael minnesota and my question are more people from st michael here yes <laughs> or at least minnesota um my question is the, the show involves a lot of music, like one of the people who made the comic books is a Heck yeah. musician. Uh -huh. And there's some really cool scenes with amazing songs. So I wanted to know what's your favorite scene involving like a really cool song or a really cool part of the soundtrack? Oh, well. I quite like the used uh, uh, Noel Gallagher solo uh, tune, which was... I think it was in the t when number five is just in the apocalypse. And, oh, uh huh. And they lose that tune. I really liked it. And uh, you know, the, the the music sort of transcends time and space because it's from all over the place, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but that song really, I don't know why exactly. It was just I can't remember exactly what song it was, but it was a Noel Gallagher's "High Flying Birds," which is his solo thing. And I think it was from his first album. I think it surprised me as well because I'd gotten into it a bit because I like Oasis stuff. I really like Noel Gallagher he's, when he's on the radio and so he's really kind of bright and funny and surprising and it's so sarcastic that it makes <laughs> it delightful. But um, so I was very interested and then it just popped up in the show, you know, and uh, so I really liked that. I really, really liked that. It was unexpected. Do they ever play music? Because obviously it's added, you know, in post. Do you ever know yeah. if you're filming a scene what song is going to be associated? Oh, with Steve, Steve is pretty. I mean, there are a lot. Like we'll get the scripts, and in the stage direction, it'll have oh. like over this fight scene, this song by this artist is going to be playing. And sometimes by the we time hope. we get, yeah, yeah, because then you know the artist wants five hundred thousand dollars for. 30 seconds of their song and Netflix is like no <laughs> but you know he's very deliberate with the music that is selected for the show um, but you know like the the compilation of all of us dancing in the first episode like we knew from day one yeah. that it was going to be that Tiffany song, the Tiffany right? song yeah. yeah and so on set you know they essentially just let the cameras roll press play and for 30 minutes we all just danced around our rooms I love and that it. was pretty much it and then they just took what they liked and um you know but yeah I think that's one of the the really fun unique parts about our show is that the, the music is very specifically mm -hmm. selected um yeah front and center yeah. yeah and steve is really really good about that and so you know gerard has his creative input as well and i think he's really adamant about songs and the music that um is because you know music tells a, a completely different story absolutely so it's really important that the story that the actors are telling and you know the final cut is telling is you know accompanied well with the music um, I liked the cover that Gerard did, yeah. Hazy Shade of Winter. Uh -huh. I liked that very much, because isn't that a Simon and Garfunkel song? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That looked like Mary did a cover, I did a cover. They're, they're also, I know, I was like, Steve, you're really having me out here doing all the things. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, what, yeah, what, but what did you cover? The, 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 my cold open in episode eight, Stormy Weather, when I'm driving, that's me singing Stormy Weather, which is also very That's awesome, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, great question, thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Maria from Chicago, and I was wondering what your favorite line is from the show so far. There you go. Cool. Do you have a standout line from your character, or it could be another character? Maybe. I honestly think you just Patrick Swayze'd me is one of my favorite lines. Which I made up. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, that is a great line. <laughs> uh, can't remember. Uh, I know. You, now it's like it's been what two and a half years. I'm like, do what you did have I a, even say? <laughs> do you have a favorite line from the season? Yeah, you deprived the village of their idiot. Oh, oh yeah, that's, oh, that's <laughs> a good one. 
I quite liked as well the when Diego was tying me up in the attic <laughs> and there was just this lovely bit where it's nice when you get to reminisce on camera I think it's a very nice thing when you draw people in through remembering something it's a nice trick and uh, so there was a lovely bit where uh, the specific details of Klaus's time in Vietnam when he like j j just experiencing the beauty of, of that country in the mountain of the crouching beast and I really really enjoyed performing that because I sort of imagined it in, in, in my mind's eye as, as vividly as I possibly could and I just kind of put myself there and was just like God that was brilliant and um, so that was really nice that I, I really liked that dialogue because it was it was very well written thank you thanks thanks Maria hi hi mm. um, I was also interested in like Klaus's performance when he went to the VA bar it was so like so powerful I don't know what, what did you draw on or how did you draw on such an experience that would be so difficult to dredge up as like a fictional experience that like a person had never drawn upon themselves I thought I was really impressed by it I was moved thank you very much you know I did a play a few years back and I was rehearsing it and I remember uh, being in the rehearsal room and all the other actors were around the sides and Sir Trevor Nunn, <laughs> like famous theatrician of the last 50 years was sat in front of me and I felt terrified and I went, Rob, your terror is not needed. And when you feel that heckle, just put it aside because that's not what people are coming to pay tickets for, to see, you know? It's self-indulgent to be scared. And what happened then is I made a realization that, wow, when I just completely turned down the volume on that primitive heckle, then you're free to, to express emotion as intensely and as vividly as you possibly can. So. That was a, a thing that kind of advanced me forward and I think was key to the intensity of, of all that for Klaus, you know, because um, I basically for about nine weeks in London was having a nervous breakdown on stage every night and it was brilliant. I loved it so much. It was beautiful, you know, it was therapeutic. and. Um, so I felt I was sort of practiced. That had only been a few years before. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think that was a lot to do with it. Because I, I was I played Richard the Third on stage, so it was like, Jesus Christ Almighty, <laughs> you know. So yeah, that that helped greatly. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I agree. It was such a poignant scene. It was really beautiful. Thanks. Super cool. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Appreciate it very much. Hi. Hi. Um, I go to school to be a psychologist. Excuse me, a psych yeah, psychologist. And uh, while studying, we always have to look at family dynamics. So before the show, I always had to use Shameless, but I was always like lost because it never had the dynamics of a family that's not biological. And I think you guys done such a great job that now I can make those connections to each one of your characters versus something that we are studying and trying to find out more treatment for it. And so I just want to say thank you for good acting. And oh, also, I have to you. tell you, sweetie, it is still incest if you are a doctor. <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> it is still incest on, on some level. But um, just thank you so much. And like, besides being, the show being entertaining, it is very educational for us who are studying the fields of addiction studies, mental health, and just like family dynamics and stuff. So thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing. Good luck with your degree. High praise indeed. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Jenna from Sterling Heights. I, besides asking the obvious question that I know is bugging so many of us, Robert, where are our seed balls? <laughs> I thought, you know, American Customs might be asking questions if I brought a big bag of soil <laughs> to America. You'd be surprised what you can see. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I gave them all away. 
I did this Extinction Rebellion event last week in London and part of it, there was loads of different things going on. There was a voodoo clown priestess and there was a, there was a, which, which by, just as a side note, that was incredible. There was this, there was this amazing performer and she was walking around this party with such incredible intensity and dedication. And I sort of just came up to get a closer look at her because to, to see how she was dressed, she, lo she looked exactly like that. She looked like a clown priestess. Uh, she was in this kind of green garb. And then I came up to kind of get a closer look and she stopped and she was carrying this lotus flower made out of material with all soil inside of it. And she saw me and she turned to me. And as she turned to me, her two aides, these guys dressed as in green as well they they took me aside and they put a, a mat down on the floor and they said she bids you kneel <laughs> and i was like <laughs> and then we did this beautiful ritual where they were sort of m whispering this prayer in my ears <laughs> and she she took my hands and she put them into this soil in this this lotus flower that she'd opened and then she was kind of rubbing the soil into the palms of my hands and she was like dead stare intense gaze in my face it was like you know and it, it, it sort of spoke to the kind of old pagan appreciation the kind of druidic love of the earth you know the thing that we're all trying to save if you're part of the extinction rebellion thing and it hit me in such a non-rational deep poetic way it was like wow holy shit anyway and next to that i was doing a seed ball making station <laughs> where <laughs> where you show people how to make uh, wildflower seed balls, which you can just kind of sling, you know, next to a tree or in some grass. And, uh, you know, when, it, when spring rolls around, they'll start to grow. So, uh, yeah, I didn't have any room in my suitcase for them in for Chicago, I'm afraid. I might forgive you. Yeah. Verdict's still out. Um, but my question was going to be, as two real-life princesses, um, which Disney princess do you identify with? I quite liked the one in Aladdin. She has a name Jasmine? and it's Jasmine. I can't remember. Jasmine, Jasmine. Jasmine. <laughs> Just because she had really cool clothes. I liked her, her garb. She had these kind of new romantic pants on and I quite liked her look. Are you trying to reach her length and hair? I'm just yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> it looked good. <laughs> um, she's not a princess, but I, Mulan is my favorite. They just made that into a movie. Can't wait. I'll be there so opening excited. day. They shot that in <laughs> so New Zealand. Excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please forgive me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a quick question. What's the most embarrassing thing you had to do? On set? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was like, in life? <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> most embarrassed, maybe most embarrassed. Like we could be here all day. <laughs> yeah, scene or moment of filming for the first season. Um, oh man. Or it could be like a behind the scenes, maybe joke or. Oddly, dancing was tough for me. You know, it was it was tricky. Also because it was my first day. I think the dancing in the first episode. That was my first day's filming. So there's a hundred people all on set, and you're like, hello, hiya, hello, hiya, and then. <laughs> And then they're like, now dance like no one's watching. You know? <laughs> so that was pretty embarrassing. Yeah. I honestly think, yeah, I, that, was, that was harder than I thought. The scenes, it's, the scenes where you don't actually have to talk are sometimes the scenes that are the trickiest. <laughs> You're like, you just want me to dance? Okay. I guess I'll just dance with this mannequin <laughs> and this boa um yeah i mean i think we mostly have just like funny moments i don't know if we've had any was it awkward was that what your question was your most awkward moment oh. embarrassing embarrassing yeah we didn't have any like i didn't have any big like costume mishaps or anything <laughs> a little nip slip or something <laughs> Yeah, none of I, you know, I, I'm I'm always getting people's name wrong, oh. you know, and that's that's pretty embarrassing, especially if you've been working with them for two months. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I completely there is, I completely ate shit this second season. Do you remember that scene when I fell? 
in the driveway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't seen it yet, and you won't, hopefully. I don't know, the edit. <laughs> Look for real. It might actually end up in there. But I really ate it really hard trying to be slick running across a gravel driveway in high heels. Oh, not, that was not the move. I have, like, scars all up my leg. It didn't go very well. <laughs> um, yeah, it was bad. Like, straight through my pants. So that was... Uh, that was unfortunate. <laughs> well, thank you. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How's Hello. it going? Hello. How's it going out there? Good. Pretty good. Pretty relaxed, yeah. you know? Any more relaxed than I'd be asleep. Is that your cat? Honest. It is my cat. Okay. Yes. I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a critical role reference. Yeah. When did it pass away? <laughs> you know what? I was trying not to talk about it. It was yes. Sorry, sorry, I brought it up. He's just in the spotlight. <laughs> yes. Isn't he glorious? Uh, so I'm Brendan Rather. I'm from Belvedere. And I think that the show is delightful, but arguably extremely bizarre. And so knowing that you've had such little exposure to the source material before you went out there and filmed it, I'm curious about your initial impressions mentally of the script. And maybe not just the first episode, but for any of them. When you first read the scripts, or, or has there ever been a point when you've read the current script where you're like, what? How is that going to happen? Or, you know, just... A, 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 I think a there is that moment every episode. Yeah. <laughs> every single episode we get, we read it, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and then you watch it, and you're like, that totally works. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and you become very preoccupied with your own character's yeah. journey, I think, and... Uh, so like, you know, you might get script five, script six, and you're like, you're kind of discovering the show much like you guys did, you know, but through reading the scripts and going, oh, we're going to pop back in that, and we're going to unpack that part of the story, and oh, this bit, you know, and the second series actually was was like a lot of there was a lot of moments like that reading the scripts for me there was like oh is it the continuation of this person and sort of so uh you kind of you didn't concern yourself too much with it until you were given it it was sort of ready to be you know because you're kind of uh the, the sort of character journey bit can be quite insular and thank god we have uh, stewards of the ship, Steve and the writing team, who are unpacking that story and doing it in very intriguing ways. So we were kind of discovering, you know, getting our heads around it as best we could, you know. So it goes through stages, you know, like you, the first, like at the beginning of a season, we'll talk to boss, dad, Steve, and he will kind of pitch our character's journey to us. And then there's, but there's so many other strands going on, so, you know, it's just like very, very sort of new and all that. And, you know, but when we start shooting episode, you know, 201, they've only written maybe one, two, and three. You know what I mean? So it's like, this is where we think you're going, but then if, you know, we're in episode four and they decide to change something, like by the time we get to 10, that idea that he had for us, that first initial conversation is like no longer on the table anymore. So it's, it's very, you know, this, they're writing the scripts as we are shooting the show. And so, you know, it's, everything is constantly in flux and, you know, that we're constantly having to like call Steve and be like, hey, uh, this is happening now in this episode, but what about blah, 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 blah. And then they'll have to kind of renegotiate and assess and kind of pick apart the strands and kind of try to sew it back together. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of manipulation of the script as we go. Um, even, you know, while we're shooting, it's happening. Like, you know, we'll have to call Steve while we're on set and be like, this dialogue isn't actually making sense anymore because we changed that thing in the other episode. So now I'm kind of saying this thing and it's weird, you know, so it's a lot of it, it's constantly changing, which is cool. Um, and, you know, I think that's the exciting part is that, you know, there is kind of this, they have this outline for all of us, but then once we get into it and start shooting, things kind of, there's like an ebb and flow and things grow and change and things work and don't work or we shoot it and then, you know, three months later we have to go back and reshoot it because it didn't work or, you know, so... There's, there's a, it's a lot always, of plates yeah. spinning. Yeah, there's so plates many plates spinning, and yeah. balls in the air at all yeah. times. And it's important to be able to pivot as an actor. Yeah, to, yeah you have yeah. to be flexible and kind of just go with, okay, well, I guess that, and like whole plot lines will just get canned. And you're just like, oh, 
Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. And one last, this is going to be our last question. Can you make it a quick one? Because technically we're out of time, but you've been standing there, so. Yeah. So my name's Raven. I'm from Aurora, Illinois. Cool name. Thank you. <laughs> Aurora. <laughs> Wayne's World. <laughs> So the show and the comics have more differences than similarities, but if you had the opportunity, the opportunity to bring something in from the comics into the show, what would you bring in? My purple hair. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I do love the the levitation yeah. of clowns. Uh -huh. Like he's so sort of drenched in ennui, but yet he's floating in midair. <laughs> I love that, you know. So, yeah, I like the kind of... It's quite tricksy, you know? It's quite yeah. characterful of him, so... Yes. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Cool Thank question. you. Thank you so cool much, question. you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much. Thank for you all. Thank you. you guys enjoy greatly. this hour? One more big round of applause! Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, like, like now. Oh, and... Have fun and follow your fandom.